Welcome to Heartwood Church Online. We're glad that you chose to connect with us virtually and hope that in the future you'll connect with the people of Heartwood, either through other virtual events or in person. The ministry of Heartwood Church can be summarized in two words, life and strength. A life grows stronger when a person faithfully connects to Jesus, the source of life and Heartwood Church helps people make and grow that connection in deep and practical ways. To engage with us today, you can leave a comment on the video, fill out the connection card at heartwood.church slash contact us, or text us at 651-321-3204. We pray today's worship brings us all life and strength. Today's scripture reading is Mark 1, 14 through 20. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As he passed alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, putting their nets in order. Immediately he called them. And they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Let's pray. Lord, today, as we seek to follow you, let us follow you with all our hearts, leaving everything behind so that we too can fish for other people. Lord, our shepherd, Jesus builds his church and commands us to go and make disciples. We thank you for the lives that we have been able to touch. We ask for the prepared souls, the empowered harvesters, and the physical and spiritual resources necessary to do the work you call us to do. Amen. Savior, I come. Oh 
My youngest daughter has several different places that she calls school. She goes to daycare and she calls that school. She also has swim class, that's swim school. And when she attends a Curious Creatures event at the Oakdale Nature Center, she calls that nature school. But one day recently she had a different take on daycare school. We were talking about her teachers, Mr. Max and Miss Michelle. And she told me, that's not school, they're my family. That comfort level she has with her teachers lets me know that they genuinely care about her. When Tim Purcell taught us about the marks of a disciple, his third mark was a disciple lives in genuine community. I have no problem with that phrase, but we'll see in Matthew chapter 12 that Jesus has a specific description for his genuine community. The genuine community of Jesus is a family. Matthew 12, 46 through 50. While he, Jesus, was still speaking with the crowds, his mother and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to the one who was speaking to him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Stretching, stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus calls his disciples, not just the twelve apostles, but all who were there following and learning from him, family. We saw in our previous message that God the Son and God the Father are in an intimate relationship. And through the Son, Jesus, others are brought into a relationship with God the Father. A relationship with God is a good thing to have. God is the source of life, of love, of forgiveness, of strength. The question I want to answer today is, how do I know if I'm in God's family? Because disciples are Jesus' family. The first thing I want us to notice is that Jesus' family is obscure. There are some families that have dominant DNA traits where you can just tell they are related. A former pastor of mine, Mike Anderson, has brothers that are obviously his brothers. They are each their own men, but they look similarly and they act similarly. I have a, another friend, Stephen, in California whose son looks exactly like him. It's like the mom didn't contribute any DNA at all and they got a clone. Stephen's own parents look at pictures and they can't tell if it's an old picture of their son or a new picture of their grandson. There are also obvious markers of being in Jesus' family. But by obscure, I mean it's not always obvious who's going to be in Jesus' family. Jesus' family members have to be found. In our passage, Jesus is speaking with crowds inside a house and Outside the house are Jesus' biological mother and brothers, Jesus' real family. We know from parallel passages that they can't get inside to speak to Jesus because there are just too many people inside. They can't get through, but a message gets passed along to Jesus. Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside and they want to talk to you. To the person giving the message, it's obvious who Jesus' family is. It's those people standing on the outside. Jesus says it's not so obvious who his family is. Jesus' family is obscure. It's hidden. Jesus asks, who is my mother and who are my brothers? With that question, Jesus implies both that he knows who his family is and that he is searching for his family. There's one part of his family that Jesus is not searching for. That's not obscure. Jesus asks about his mother. Jesus asks about his brothers. In verse 50, Jesus mentions sisters, but nowhere does he question the location of or his relationship to the Father. 
Some commentators have guessed that Jesus' family may be looking to talk with him and Joseph is not there because Joseph has died. That's certainly a possibility. But regardless of the reason why Joseph is not there, Jesus takes the opportunity to emphasize the fact that he already has a relationship with the Father. And the Son and the Father together are looking to complete their family. This is what Jesus means in John 10, 16. But I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. Are Jesus' natural brothers his family? They grew up with him. They have the same mom, even though different dads. And an important thing we know about Jesus' brothers is that they don't believe in him. John 7, 5 says, For even his brothers did not believe in him. They don't believe that Jesus, their brother, is the promised Messiah and Savior. Mary, Jesus' mother, on the other hand, we know she does believe. So is everyone standing outside wanting to talk with Jesus, his true family, part of the family of God? No, or at least not yet. Jesus is also an Israelite. Is everyone that is part of Israelite heritage part of Jesus' family? Romans 9, 6 says, Now it is not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. The Apostle Paul is saying here that it takes more than being born a Jew to be in God's family covenant. Jesus is looking around at this crowd of people asking, Who is my family? Are you my family? Disciples are Jesus' family. If Jesus is looking for his family, then I also, as a member of his family, should be looking for others. This is the heart of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which we'll be looking at in our final lesson. The question for us now, the questions for us now are first, is Jesus still looking for me or am I found? And second, do I think I'm family because I grew up in the church or am I really just standing on the outside? If I'm on the outside, there is a way in. Jesus' family is open. We know Jesus is looking for his family, and then in verse 49, he finds them. Stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Jesus doesn't point outside and say, There they are. He points to the people inside and says, There you are. Who is inside that house? Well, we have no idea. But who has Jesus called so far? Fishermen, tax collectors, political anarchists, teachers of the law, prostitutes, rich people, poor people, disabled people, men and women. I don't know if all those types of people were in the house that day, but whoever could get into the house was family. Some people had a problem with John Calvin's doctrine of election, God alone choosing who is saved. But John Calvin was also a fervent evangelist because even in his interpretation of election, Calvin understood that we humans have no idea who God elects. John Calvin said, quote, If God would have painted a yellow stripe on the backs of the elect, I would go around lifting shirts. But since he didn't, I must preach, whoever will and when whatsoever, whosoever believes that he is the son, you know, whoever believes, excuse me, is the elect. I don't have to be in the genetic bloodline of Jesus. I don't have to be an Israelite. Galatians three twenty-seven through 29 says, For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This doesn't mean that I'm no longer a male or have brown skin and live in a free country. It does mean that whatever my previous identifications, I am now included and equal. Jesus' family, the church, is not like what we've heard about the Star Wars franchise from actor John Boyga, who was brought into the Star Wars family and told and presented to the public as a main character star and then was relegated to side comedy character. In God's family, all disciples are equal children. Mark DeMaz, one of the leaders of multi-ethnic ministry in the United States, said this, 
For 25 years, the primary emphasis within the U.S. church has been multiplication, i.e. plant more churches. Yet more has not produced better in terms of our collective witness or credibility. Homogeneity, that's congregations where everyone is basically the same ethnically and socially, that's what got us into this mess. Say no to perpetuating it, plant multi-ethnic. Properly representing God's family of disciples is one reason why we at Hartwood Church have multi-ethnic ministry as a core value. Whatever kind of person I am, Jesus is looking to adopt me fully into his family. Once a person is brought into God's family, they have an identifying characteristic. Because being included doesn't mean I can continue to do and define myself however I want. Jesus' family is obedient. Matthew 12, 50. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Matthew 12, 50 and other verses like it, I think, are often neglected in favor of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. That's a verse we discussed last week as part of the rest Jesus offers his disciples. Speaking of obedience, Jesus said of himself in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus is an obedient son, and if I am in Jesus' family, I should also do the will of God the Father. Faith in the person and work of Jesus for salvation is absolutely a mark that a person is a disciple and family of Jesus. But Jesus says here that the person who really is his family, who really believes in him for salvation, that person obeys God the Father. I can tell who is in Jesus' family not by their claim of faith, but by their work of obedience. That's what the whole book of James, the brother of Jesus, is about. James 2, 18 and 19. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? Good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Belief is not enough. Demons believe, but they do not obey. Demons can't call themselves God's family based only on belief and neither can I. We've seen this recently in our national politics. Every national official has to swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. And yet, from the election until the swearing-in of the new president, I've seen questionable adherence to that oath from people of both major political parties. However, and it doesn't matter how you feel about him as a person or official, I think former Vice President Mike Pence showed his belief by his obedience distinctly on two occasions. When Nancy Pelosi requested that Mike Pence enact the 25th Amendment and remove then-President Trump, this is what he wrote in his letter response. First, he references Trump's request that Pence, as president of the Senate, reject certain electoral college votes. This is a quote from his letter. Last week, I did not yield to pressure to exert power beyond my constitutional authority to determine the outcome of the election, and I will not now yield to efforts in the House of Representatives to play political games at a time so serious in the life of our nation. As you know full well, the 25th Amendment was designed to address political incapacity or disability. Just a few months ago, when you introduced legislation to create a 25th Amendment commission, you said a president's fitness for office must be, be determined by science and facts. You said then that we must be very respectful of not making a judgment on the basis of a comment or behavior that we don't like, but based on a medical decision. Madam Speaker, you were right. Under our Constitution, the 25th Amendment is not a means of punishment or usurpation. End quote. Mike Pence shows us that it's not about my political party. It's not about what I want. It's not about what I say I believe. It's about what I do that shows to who I belong. I will quickly give us three ways to show obedience. And they should be easy to remember because they're the same three main points of the other sermons uh, in this series. First, obedience is shown by following Jesus. Following doesn't just mean to answer Jesus' call, but it means to become like Jesus. Follow in Jesus' actions and attitudes toward God and people. 
Jesus said in Luke 6.40, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Second, obedience is shown by learning. Continue to grow deeper in my relationship with God. I need to learn to better love God. And Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commands. And third, obedience is shown by making more disciples. Obedient disciples make disciples. This is the command of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, our text for next week. Being part of a family is both a privilege and a responsibility. As human children, none of us get to choose our family. But as with God's family, we can all choose whether or not we will act as family. Let's pray this psalm of praise from Psalm 62. Rest in God alone, my soul, for he is my hope, and it comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. God, we thank you for calling us into the protection of your family, and may we not neglect living as sons and daughters. Amen. As you reflect on this message, think of one thing that resonated with you, one thing that challenged you, one thing you want to learn more about, and one thing you will do based on what you've learned. And I'd like to leave you with this blessing. May the weakest among us be like King David. May the God who gives encouragement and endurance give us the spirit of unity as we follow Christ, so that with one heart and one mouth we may together glorify the God and Father of our Lord. worshiping with us today. Don't forget to reach out through the comments, connection card, or text line. To support Heartwood Church financially, we have secure online giving through Tithely and Venmo. You can download either of these apps or go to heartwood.church/give. Have a blessed week.